Bigger than ever, it's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Sooner Scoop crew. Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and George. All right, welcome back. It is another edition of the unofficial 40 podcast right here at Soonerscoop.com where the uh, entire crew is here. We've got Josh, Eddie, George, uh, I am Carrie, and uh, we have a, uh, a week of football. No more bye weeks, and we're sitting on your couch, although I did do that over the weekend, except it was kind of nice that Baker and Kyler weren't playing because I could just unplug a little bit, and who the hell's going to watch the Cowboys on a Monday night? So pretty much I got all my so- all my football stuff out on a, uh, a Saturday uh, just watching the Georgia and Tennessee game, just leading up to that, I thought it was an okay day of football. But um, anyway, welcome back, everybody. The unofficial forty presented by Schwab Meat Company, the official champion of the holidays. We'll tell you more about that as we go along. But uh, obviously, Alabama coming to town. Brent Venables had his press conference yesterday. Uh, Eddie and George had their practice report off of that. Uh, plenty to get through there uh, as well. We did talk to the players on Monday night, although it was. It's pretty clear that this team is done talking. Uh, you know, they they are at a point I think where they just they just need to try and win a football game if they can. Not so interested in talking about the ins and outs of it. And you know, I don't blame them. Uh, you know, we did talk to Jackson Arnold, and um, let me let me start there. Jackson Arnold named team captain. Brett was asked about him yesterday. But to me, if I had to describe how I... I was there on Monday night, and I was there at the press conference yesterday. But just the mood around Jackson Arnold, to me, seems to be like he's playing this thing out. you guys feel that way at all? I don't know what you mean. Like he's playing playing it it out out until the season is over. I mean, I think... he's probably never going to come back. I I have no idea what's going to happen, to be honest with you. I I think he's said everything but stopped short of saying, I don't know who's going to be the offensive coordinator. Like, yeah. does Oklahoma want me back? Who are they going to get in the transfer portal? Are they going to be active in the transfer portal? There's a lot of stuff out there that uh, is just kind of, you you can't answer it right now because there are no answers. I don't think anybody knows. I think the one... I, mean, I feel like we know more about, like, what's going to happen with the offensive coordinator than what's going to happen with uh, the program at large. With the quarterback room and <laughs> yeah. everything else and be, assistant be coaches and... But, I, you know, I, I feel like he's going to say a lot with his performance against Alabama. And, you know, nobody's – nobody. I don't believe anybody asked Brent if he's, go, if he's willing to play two quarterbacks on Saturday. He just kind of assumed that Jackson would go out there as a starter. But, obviously, he goes out there and has a bunch of turnovers. You're going to have to make a move back to Michael Hawkins. I'm going to be honest. I, I care about the game on Saturday – we have a lot I, of podcasts, so don't shit on just Alabama part of it yet, I'm right? Not, I'm not. We got I, the coordinator I, stuff to even, get through. Even the LSU stuff. I we got the Michael Fasusi stuff to so, get through. I am so uh, more in tune with the offensive coordinator situation and what's going to happen there than I, you know, Jackson Arnold and Michael Hawkins. I just we'll see if they end up back at Oklahoma next year, but it definitely feels like to me that whoever they hire at offensive coordinator is bringing in a quarterback and whether that's the guy that's with them right now, wherever they're at or someone else, it just feels like that's what's going to happen. Yeah. I, and you know, I and I hope just, Jackson, I, that would be, if Jackson came back to Oklahoma next year and proved us all wrong, that would be awesome. I just don't, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like that's what's going to happen. Here's, here's point. the question. I think the only way that you almost come open to the idea of, Jackson coming back or even that he could have a future here at Oklahoma is if he goes out and they have some type of act of God, like a career day against Alabama or LSU. And which, I still don't even know if that would be enough. I'm going to say I'm I don't gonna think say any this, of us think that's going to happen. It's Maybe. After the Missouri game, it was easy to say, based on just recency bias or whatever, it's been a week and a half now. I still feel like they're better off just clearing cleaning house in the quarterback room. If you're going to bring in a transfer with the, with this offensive coordinator, if it's Joe Craddock and you bring in Mensa, if it's 
um, Arbuckle and you bring in his quarterback. Mateer. Mateer. John Mateer. I, I, from a depth standpoint, I almost feel like you want one of them to come back at least because I do think that yeah. everything you is You don't just, want to be back in that I just situation go, you were with Dylan Gabriel when you sure. just Davis Bevel. And I just go back to the idea, too, that I, I don't know how you can judge anything outside of like not being able to hold on to the football in Jackson's case or just being relatively extremely young in Michael Hawkins case. And, you know, to a certain extent, Jackson still is to really know what they are. I mean, I think that there's still talent in both of those guys and why not let one of them roll the dice and come back and you bring somebody else in and it's an open competition. I mean, I know that kind of sounds shitty, but it's kind of the situation that they're in. But Eddie, the point, the, the thing with bringing in somebody in open competition, those guys that we're talking about, a Darian Minsa, John Mateer, uh, Sawyer Robertson, whoever it is that enters yeah, the portal, I, I know they're not going. coming to compete for the job. No, but well, here's if, the other if they thing. come in, and Jackson, Jackson Arnold's not staying to compete for a job. Well, Jackson the reality, get a the reality job guys, is too. NIL is going to determine whether they feel like they're still here now. Like it's what's crazy about it is Josh. Like you're going to decide on your quarterback, and it's just like with Dylan Gabriel. You had to make a decision because where was the money going? You weren't going to pay Dylan Gabriel and Jackson Arnold both over a million dollars. So are you going to keep paying Jackson the, I don't know what the amount is. Let's just say it's a million dollars. Are you going to keep paying him a million dollars if you hire a new offensive coordinator and he's bringing in his quarterback? Yeah, that's, that's that'll answer whether or not he's going to stay or not. That's the other side, and I think right now, from what we've been able to see throughout this year, whether it be right or wrong, you take, it, you take your chances on rolling the dice with somebody else. Like somebody else gets their opportunity, and I yeah, don't think if that has to be the number, there's no way you you just cannot justify that. I'm I mean, I, all these things are running through my head just from a business perspective. Like, how do you even make up that contract to try and convince a guy to stay? Like, if you become the starter, then your salary will you know will increase to one million dollars. Like, what quarterback is what? quarterback is signing that deal across the country that was a five-star or four-star coming out of college or high school not very many especially when you can go somewhere else and probably get I mean, maybe not yeah. equal but yeah. you're going to get a good amount of money there's got to be somebody that believes that they can turn him around or fix him whatever you want to call it that, that's the interesting part guys to me do you feel like nationally there is more belief in what Jackson Arnold can still be than there is locally. Yes. Like, I mean, that's a weird 100%. Kind of thing to think about. 100%. But it's also, I think, pretty self-explanatory in that we've seen every snap that he's taken as opposed to somebody that looks at a box score and just thinks, oh, man, Oklahoma's just f***ed offensively. I can't believe they're making this kid go through it. Here's I, the, That's how I would look at it from the outside. Here's Here's the thing, guys, that we have to continue to realize when we're talking about quarterback situation, offensive line, who they're going to hire offensive coordinator, all this stuff. Brent is coaching for his job next year. Do you think he wants to run it back with a quarterback that has continually showed him this year that he can't make the big play? Like, I just don't buy that Brent's going to do that. And it's the same thing with, uh, you know, running it back with some of the assistants. Does he want to stick with a Bill Beatenbow where the offensive line hasn't been great this year, but if he loses Bill Beatenbow... He's losing a ton of offense alignment that would come back next year. And that's what, you know, the Joe Craddock situation, I believe Joe Craddock probably wants the Oklahoma job. I believe he also wants to bring his offensive line coach. If he were to do that, Brent would be starting over on the offensive line, probably having to rebuild it through the portal. And then all of a sudden, you're doing exactly what you did this last year. So it's all these, all these choices that Brent has to make. He has to be thinking, I have one year to figure this out, and then you go from there. And so that's why all of those things factor into that. And I just don't see a scenario where he goes, okay, I'm going to bet my future on Jackson Arnold next year. I And maybe that's wrong. I don't know. Maybe Jackson goes and proves everybody wrong somewhere else. I just think that Brent isn't going to be thinking like that, you know? Here's the thing about... Or he is thinking like here's that. Here's the thing I, I, I can't stop thinking about with Beedenbo is... Look, OU brags about their track record with players in the NFL. Like, Bill Biedenboe didn't coach all those guys. Josh, you know this. Offensive line yep. coaching in Oklahoma, it was Mark Mangino. And then it was Kevin Wilson. And then it was uh, Bruce Kittle and James Patton. And then it was Bill Biedenboe. Like, 
Well, Bill coached a lot of them, though. You, but I'm you're, saying you're referring to like Lane Johnson and Trent Williams. Yeah, but, Jamal Brown. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm but I'm saying, oh, he's produced NFL offensive linemen for before Bill Beanpo. Yeah, and, not a big, the, the, yeah, but the not job a of a, the job of an offensive line coach one is to be a good coach, but also to be able to recruit and retain those guys. Because Josh remembers this when Mark Mangino was here. He would, did a shitty job of retaining guys. He chased guys off left and right before you ever got a chance to know what they were as offensive linemen and highly recruited guys. And Kevin it, Wilson, you know, did a better job of managing those guys than, than Mark Mangino did. Guys, I, I can't imagine, like, I, I would love to drop one of these offensive line back into like 01 Oklahoma when you basically went from Mark Mangino all season long to that version of Jerry Schmidt. God, that had to be hellacious. Like that had to be brutal just day in and day out. The assault on just your overall psyche like at all times. Uh, I can't even imagine. But yeah, I mean, you're right, Carrie. What is interesting about this to me is – so for those that don't know, you know, and George mentioned it, there, there's a lot of talk that Craddock is dead set on, I've got to have my offensive line coach. This is the first year they've worked together. Like, I, I don't know, like, it's really interesting to me that there is that level of like, oh, this guy's got to be the guy. Um, because, you know, the Rouchard guy, uh, Dan Rouchard is the guy's name. He's been in the you know the NFL for a long, long time. Uh, was a guy with the Saints for a long time, and Craddock last year you know was was with uh, Troy with Summerall at Troy. So like it's not like they have this long standing relationship. So it's kind of interesting to me, and I don't know to t- if if I take that as this guy just marries so well with what I want to do offensively, or if it, he sees it as kind of a. I don't know what I'm getting out of Bill Biedenboe anymore. Like, I, I, th- I think that's a really interesting thing, like where that line kind of falls. Isn't there, shouldn't there be almost like an interview process with an – like, you can tell Craddock, like, okay, you can be our offensive coordinator, but we still have – it's like Senate confirmation hearings. Like, we have to con- confirm your, off- your offensive staff. Like, we want to bring in your offensive line coach that has coached a long time in the NFL – is he going to be supportive of NIL? Is he going to shit on it? Like, how is he going to handle the, like keeping NIL different from just coaching a guy? To, the the guy though that so Tulane has two offensive line coaches. The one that Craddock wants to bring with him is a younger guy that's not the NFL guy. He's coached okay. with him. Oh, okay. I had missed. Okay, yeah. I'm looking at him now. Evan McKissick is yes. what it says. And here. maybe you could bring him. Okay. which he's coached tight ends before. Maybe he would mm-hmm. come and coach tight ends, or maybe he would do a similar role in which he is at Tulane, uh, which is is just the I think he's in it. What's his official title? Co offensive coordinator and offensive line coach. Yeah, or something yep, like that's that. That's right. Um, so I don't know. I, I you know maybe you could convince him. Hey, we'll give you that same title here at Oklahoma and Bill. Be- but would Bill Beatembo want to do that? Where they have two offensive line coaches? I have no idea. Stoops did it with Patton and, and Kittle. Whereas I think if they were to hire a Ben Arbuckle, I would feel comfortable saying that Bill Biedenbo would be back. Because yes. he's an air raid guy. Correct. Oh, I mean, they, that marries really naturally. And so, and then again, again, viewing it from Brent's perspective, maybe in if you were hiring for the long term and you were coming off a 10-win season or something, the offensive line wasn't very good or whatever – Maybe you could move on from a Bill Beat and Bow and bring in somebody new and start fresh there. But when you've already tried to rebuild the offensive line through the portal, and if you were to lose Bill, you'd have to do that again, most likely. Like, I don't know if Brent wants to do that. So I wonder if that holds up on, you know, hiring a Joe Craddock, for example. And with all that said, I mean, I, could it be also true that Ben Arbuckle's his guy? Yeah, like we're talking it, about Craddock, very well, and it very well could end up being Arbuckle, which I think I'm definitely kind of warming up to that idea. And if he's, I mean, if you're Brent, and one of your big mentors is Bob, I mean, Bob made his reputation through the air raid. Uh, it, it's worked good at Oklahoma in the past. I mean, I know you know it's the SEC and all that, and you want to run game, but if your job is online, like you keep saying. Uh, George, and I believe you're right on that. I mean, you, you, you'd be dumb not to think that he has one year to turn this thing around offensively or he's done. 
But like, if your job's on the line, I could see him, you know, just saying, "Yeah, let's stick with air raid." And guys, for people like, there's some context stuff that's really interesting here. So, did you guys know Tulane runs the ball roughly 67 percent of the times? Like two out of three snaps, Tulane runs. And obviously, they're doing a lot of pro style. They've got a lot of 11, 12 personnel, uh, you know, double tight ends for those who aren't familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, so you've got a lot of that kind of stuff in that offense, and they're wildly successful with it. This is not me. I, I like the scheme a lot. Like, I, I like what they do. At the same time, can Oklahoma line up double tight and run the ball consistently in the SEC? Like, are they, are they going to consistently enough have the big bodies up front to – again, he won't run the ball. I'm not saying, like, this is what he wants to do. He's got a young quarterback. He's got a really good running back. Like, I understand that there are some situational things that he's working with here. But at the same time, like, say it's 60%. Do I believe that that's a, the best formula for Oklahoma when they have to go against the Georgias, Alabamas, groups like that that are probably most of the time going to be at least a little bit better up front? than Oklahoma is, I that that's the part where I get hung up on Craddock a and, little bit. And again, if they were to do that successfully, Josh, they would have to go get a lot of dudes in the portal at offensive line and tight end. And I just don't know if that's a, a feasible thing to go do in, in, in this offseason. I would argue if you had that type of offense this year, oh, you might be bowl eligible already because they might have put the ball less in quarterbacks' hands because they... they they can run the ball. I mean, the one thing that they can do, maybe they figure out Xavier Robinson earlier, but they have run the ball against Ole Miss. You know, certainly last game against Missouri, uh, they ran it well at times, but it's a better running team than it is a passing team. And to be clear, I don't want to sound like I'm just shitting on Craddock. I'm just trying to connect the dots here. I think Joe Craddock is a great offensive coordinator, and if he doesn't get the Oklahoma job, I bet he gets – maybe the Florida State job or, or somewhere else. He's going to get a big-time job. I just am trying to think about this from, from Brent Venable's perspective of trying to have to turn this thing around as quick as possible, and I just feel like maybe Arbuckle maybe has a little bit better chance of doing that. The other name that's been thrown out there today by Pete Nakos uh, from on three, he just put up a story, is Cade Bell from Pitt. I don't know as much about Cade Bell He's not a name that I've heard a ton about, but it's, it sounds it's like it's another he's in one it. of those uh, I think stories of just a massive turnaround from yep. the offense that couldn't move the football a year ago to all of a sudden they get the Eli Holston kid. I believe is he committed to A and M and then transferred to Pitt? Is that how that went down? I can't remember. I remember uh, that name in high school recruiting. He was I wanna say he was committed to A and M. I believe he signed with Alabama okay. out of high school, if okay. I remember correctly. And then ended up transferring after a year uh, to Pittsburgh, I believe, if I I have that right. He's he's been fantastic for him. I think he's been hurt the last couple weeks, which you've seen a little bit of a drop-off. I know if you watch the uh, Pitt-Clemson game on Saturday morning, not the best showing offensively from uh, Pat Narduzzi's uh, group. They could have been point-shaving. We might need to open up an investigation. But uh, they have been pretty damn good, all things considered, for uh, Pittsburgh this yeah, year. Yeah, they started out, what, 7-0 and before they lost yeah. their first game. Uh, well, what George is doing, he's trying to bring a fresh perspective to uh, uh, the coaching search. And uh, Eddie knows all about fresh perspectives because uh, he's had LASIK surgery at Enjoy Vision. I have. And uh, the fine people over at Enjoy are... They know that it's the holiday season and it's upon us. So we are saving money at Enjoy Vision. Save $600 on LASIK at Enjoy Vision during holidays of LASIK. I had uh, LASIK surgery. It was very easy, very seamless. Something that you could possibly do around the holiday season. Uh, It was something like a Christmas miracle, but there's other miracles that need to be performed, like beating Alabama this weekend. All you got to do is uh, schedule a free consultation. Go to enjoyvision.com. That is letter N-J-O-Y, vision.com, to save $600 off LASIK. Consider this uh, a Christmas gift from me to you. Happy Merry Savings from me and Enjoy Vision. Uh, and use that Enjoy Vision to uh, enjoy 4K video on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so uh, appreciate Enjoy Vision uh, as always. And uh, guys, I mean, we can go back to the offensive coordinator talk, but it, you can't really talk about that without talking about Michael Fasusi and Josh. Uh, I know things have been all over the map with this since it was first hinted that he would be visiting Texas over the weekend. Uh, I know... 
People in Norman have been trying to figure out exactly what has happened, what is going on. Uh, I think even you had reported maybe there was an expectation he'll still end up in Norman at some point. Uh, where is everything as we sit here at one fourteen on Wednesday with Michael Fasusi? Yeah, this whole thing, and it really is, it comes down to a lot of what kind of strand of this do you want to follow? What do you want to believe? Because there's a lot happening there. It's it's not, none of it's been clear. Michael hasn't really commented publicly. You don't really know where he stands on this thing. Has um, he ghosted you at this point? We, yes. To, okay. this, to this point, I have not heard from Mike, and I don't know that anybody really has since Sunday. Um, I, I know there's, you know, I, I think people have tried to allude to it, stuff like that, but I don't think he's talked to really anyone. And I, I mean, I get it. You know, I'm sure he's just been bombarded since that news came out. I, I said, was it Sunday? Yeah, no, it was Monday. It was Monday because right as we did the recruiting report. Um, so what I, what I can understand is, Mike, uh, Mike and I had a long conversation like a week ago, almost today. And he talked about uh, he was going to be at Oklahoma for the Alabama game. That was his plan. You know, we talked about his playoff game and that all became possible. You know, once Louisville lost to Allen in the first round, we talked about that in the recruiting report. So almost immediately, it seems like plan shifted at no point to my understanding before that news broke had Oklahoma been notified, hey, I'm not coming. And I get the impression, Kerry, and I know you mentioned hearing some of the same stuff, that Oklahoma still has some belief that he may show up in Norman. I know everybody, we, we can all remember the flat tires and all the other stories. So I'm not, I'm not trying to build anybody's hope. I'm just relaying what, I have, what has been explained to me. I expect Michael to go to Texas. I think he's going to take that trip. I think he's going to go down there. I think the part that is getting lost sometimes is that he's also expected to go to Texas A&M the following week and catch the A&M Texas game uh, that that weekend right before you know what is still going to be called National Signing Day, but we all know it's just kind of a you know a ceremony at this point. Um, I have talked to a few people around Louisville. I've talked to some people that I really trust in the Dallas area. There's still a lot of faith that Oklahoma is going to end up with Michael Fasusi. And I know uh, our guy Steve Wiltfong had something on his one of his shows yesterday saying he expects Michael Fasusi to stick with Oklahoma. Now, there's a lot to go. I mean, obviously, two big campus visits, uh, all that's going on. Oklahoma, we don't know what they're going to look like against Alabama. We don't know what they're going to look like against LSU. So there's a lot of variables in there. But as it stands right now, I think people are like, oh, he's gone. That's too soon. Like, well, let's just see what happens here. I part of me feels like this is a negotiating tactic. Like, and that's the world we're living in in NIL. I have nothing to base that on. I'm just kind of connecting the dots. And Oklahoma, uh, Michael Fasusi, and, and maybe not even him. Maybe people around him are very aware that he's got Oklahoma in a pretty precarious situation right now. <sighs> Is there any part of you that thought maybe like this is because it did come out from and I'm not saying that it was planted, but it did come out from Texas's side like like the this maybe there was seed they tried to plant the seed by putting it out there uh, and now everyone is just chaos is happening and Fasusi doesn't really know how to handle this or is this simply they think that they got him to come in and someone spoke and it was going to be completely under the radar and now it's just out there. Which one which do you believe is more likely? I I honestly I, I think it's just the way the news came out. Like I, I don't think there's anything seedy here. What I will say is kind of a funny, you know, for those that want to buy into the conspiracy, I know there are some people out there that think basically that Michael Fasusi is the Trojan horse. Like he is the guy where every, like Texas, I, I when I talk to Texas and AM people, there's not some overwhelming amount of confidence. Like they kind of, kind of like puncher's chance. Like maybe, maybe something could happen here, but there is no impression that I get from anybody that's like, oh, OU's in huge trouble here. Like it, it's not that kind of vibe. Like they're just, you know, it's just a guy marching to the gallows. Like I, I don't think that's the situation here. But what I will say, is there are people that think 
it's almost kind of, like I said, kind of almost like a uh, misdirection. Look over here on this hand. Look at this Michael Fasusi situation. Don't pay attention to some schools getting trying to get involved with the manual choice or trying to get inv- like almost you know like we're going to distract everybody and look over here and we're going to try to make a move on this other guy. So uh, that's something I would keep an eye on because there are several recruits that I know schools are really really trying hard to press on. Um, and there's there's multiple things there. Like people would say, oh, it's it's Texas misdirecting. Guys, it'd be great for Nebraska to be like who has a lot of Dallas area ties and knows a lot of Texas area reporters to kind of say, hey, look at this. Like look, we're here and Michael Fasusi's going to visit Texas, but don't pay attention to us working on Cortez Mills really, really hard. Like that kind of stuff where you're just trying to throw Oklahoma, like you said, Kerry, into chaos and make it hard for them to focus on so many different moving parts. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the, the one thing to me about it is, if the A&M thing wasn't out there and you heard that he was going to go visit Texas and then finally come back to Texas and then make or to Oklahoma and then make a decision, like you'd feel like, okay. The way it came out, it just made it feel like the sky is falling, everything's falling apart, oh, here we go. Well, I think it's because everybody's yeah. been kind of waiting for that shoe to drop at yeah. some point with as bad as things have gone and without really any, I guess, true, I don't know, foresight or whatever with what's going to happen with the offensive staff, I think it's just become kind of common knowledge or people have just almost expected that something's going to happen. There's no way that they can keep all these guys together. So the way it works out, I mean, they play Alabama this weekend, then they play at LSU. So when, when? Sunday, they could hire, announce the hire. They could do it beforehand. I just, I could. I, I know you have your theory on when you think it's going to be in, in, I don't know if Pete has said something. I think it's going to be like either the Monday or Tuesday after the LSU game. But I think that there's a very good chance we know next week this is who they're targeting. Like this is going to be the guy. This is the guy. But they will officially announce it like Monday. They're sure. gonna, Josh, they're going to have to tell recruits before they tell anyone, right? Offensive. Yes. I, I mean, like, yeah, absolutely. Because especially when you're, because I got, again, I mean, for people that haven't put these timelines together, that Monday will be 48 hours before signing day. So like you're, you're, you're talking about just bam, bam, almost immediacy. And part of that too, is getting that guy signed, getting him, you know, get the whole NCA waiver and his, his change of his role so that he can get in touch with these guys and have conversations say, Hey, you know, I've watched your tape. I know you don't know me. I've seen you. I think you can play for us. This is how I see it working. You know, yada, yada, yada. Like he's going to have to have some conversations, whoever this guy may be. So, yeah, I mean, timing and I, and I think George, don't you get the feeling that they're they're They've narrowed in it on at least Three or four candidates. Yes. Yeah. I would I say mean, I think it's the three that I'm just Nako's saying four to cover my today. ass, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, there could always be um one come in late. I just it feels like it's it certainly seems like one has been ruled out. That yeah, was spoken about Mullen, at which, the uh, which, <laughs> at the press conference. I just don't shout out Dean Blevins. I know we talked about it. It was the, awesome. Yeah. Here's the thing with the Dan Mullen stuff. Did OU reach out to him? Yeah. Was he that interested in the job? I don't think so. And I also just think OU also knew and Brent knew that 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 would be a really tough... Like I, I think Dan Mullen would have probably been a good hire because of his track record and all of that, but I just don't know if that would have been the right hire for this. And I just... Like, he was never offered... I know there's people out there saying he was offered for the job. It's my understanding no one has been offered for the job as of right now. Offered the job right now. Well, and I think, you know... I'm just glad I don't have to go through uh, my Twitter page and start deleting tweets well, when I said that now. Dan Mullen was a f***ing I, loser. I, I well, do remember you going there. after him. Well, quite he, a bit. I mean, the comments coming out of the Cotton Bowl were, uh, he was a loser. He was being a loser. He was being a bitch, yeah. Uh, but if he can help call offensive plays and you know average 45 points a game, I, he can call me a loser. Forgiven. He can, forgiven. He, they can put it up on the big screen after every touchdown. Uh, you know what George, uh, you could do real quick, Josh? Uh, what you could sure. do... To settle any beef is to send him beef. You could do that through Schwab Meat Company. Uh, power move. And you can make your Thanksgiving meal easy this year by ordering your holiday turkeys and hams 
online at schwabmeat.com. You can pick up your order at Schwab's in downtown Oklahoma City if you want to, or just have it shipped straight to your home. I know we've had people in Texas that have been ordering it uh, because you get free shipping on online orders of over $75 with code Sooner Scoop. Leave my Coke alone, Lane Kiffin. Uh, $75 in orders uh, just by ordering Sooner Scoop, by ordering using the code Sooner Scoop. Schwab Meat's been smoking the highest quality turkeys and hams for your special holiday meals since 1912. So, uh, also, uh, Friendsgiving is going on. Uh, and to tell you about that, here is. Uh, a lot of Sooners like uh, that have been playing well this year. Kobe McKenzie uh, and uh, Billy Bowman, along with uh, Jada Coleman, who's probably the best of them all, uh, and uh, Kenzie Hansen, possibly Kenzie McKenzie. <laughs> Let's listen in on Friendsgiving dinner. They're playing the Schwab NIL game. Meet image likeness. Kenzie, go. Uh, Billy Bowman, ham? Billy Bow ham man. <laughs> Kobe McKenzie, turkey, Kobe Turk, yeah. Ma- Kenzie? Uh, Jada Coleman, ham. Jada Cole, ham man. Kinsey Hansen, Turk Inzy Hammonson, mm. Turk Inzy Hammonson. Two meats. Turk Inzy Hammonson, MVP of the meal. Schwab meats, turkeys, and <laughs> champions of the holidays. Once again, schwabmeat.com. Uh, get your order in for Thanksgiving, uh, and you get free shipping on online orders over seventy-five dollars with that code Sooner Scoop. All right, Josh. Back to uh, the point you were you were ready to make to George. Uh, about uh, Mullen and and uh, you know him just being out of it, basically. Yeah, you know that's the fascination with him. Like, and I and I get it. Like, it's a name hire. People would rally behind it. He's got SEC experience. Like, I get all that stuff. But I've got to think, even if like if he had been interested, does OU get a long way down the road? And it's just like, look, we're gonna like if this goes as well as frankly OU needs it to they're going to be right back in the same boat next year. And, I, and I'm not one of those people that's like, don't hire the guy because he's good. Like, I, I hate that thinking. I, I hate it. I hate it. But Dan Mullen is not a guy that's like, oh, I'm going to build my resume for a couple of weeks. Like, he is literally waiting for the the head coaching job that he's had before. And, and it's not a, you know, like he can learn from Brent Venables. Like, he's been a head coach longer than Brent Venables has. Like, I, I don't know what... Like, I, I just wonder about that. Like, I, and that's why I always felt like everybody, let's be honest, that reported a lot of stuff on Dan Mullen was just way, way out ahead of themselves on that stuff. Yeah, that was a race to be first, and it was ugly. And that's why you need to be on Sooner Scoop and only Sooner Scoop I told, with some of that stuff. I told George earlier, it is fascinating to me. Just say Arbuckle is the guy. Their average age of coordinator would be like 29, 30 years old between him and Zach Alley next year, which is, I, I don't think it's a problem. I just find it kind of fascinating. I, for some reason, outside of maybe Lincoln, you've always thought of the coordinator as like the old guy on the staff. They'd be the two youngest guys. I mean, Bob was a head coach. He was 38 when he was hired at OU. Yeah. And I will say the one hang up with Arbuckle, I think, is just his, his youth that you mentioned, sure. Eddie, and which can be viewed as a positive or negative because I do think they want someone with some experience you know that's a veteran in this and and Arbuckle's only been calling play plays for three years and he's had a lot of success doing it uh, right. for three years but I mean you're taking a pretty big risk on a guy that um is you know is doing it too at a level that's not the same as even a Tulane is when you that look at the where opponents. keeping somebody like Kevin Johns around would maybe be adequate yeah like and obviously Brent's Kevin kind of, Johns, Bill he's, Beatembo. He's insinuated that you know in all you know good situations, if everything came to pass, they would like to keep somebody like that around. Whether it be I don't know about on staff as a quarterbacks coach or just as an analyst who has you know I guess obviously kind of a bridge from what they've been trying to do this year. By the way, uh, one quick last thing on Mullen, like he's got a pretty sweet gig right now. Other than yeah. the fact that he has to sit next to that I idiot think, JoJo, I think he does a pretty good job on. TV, yeah, like during I games, I've, I've watched a lot of the Thursday night games this year, and someone is going to give him a head coaching opportunity at some point. Yeah, I, I believe that. that well, and I think do it. I think the SEC is away from a year away from just it just blowing up and being positions being everywhere open. Yeah, it's going to be yeah. interesting to see what the landscape is. Obviously, you know, I think that the one that we've always talked about when talking about Dan Mullen, what happens with North Carolina this year is Mac going to just retire. Uh, and not come back. It'll yeah. be kind of interesting to see where that goes. I think Mac's pretty. Are, checked are out. we really going to go through a year where there's not a P four opening? Oh, well, there will be somebody. 
I mean, somebody's got to go, right? West like, I'm Virginia, just, I, right? I can't believe we're here where it, it's possible. That's, that's West Virginia. That's one. one that seems like that seat's pretty warm for Neil Brown in Morgantown. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got their absolute ass kicked last weekend. That was one of the games that I did watch on uh, Saturday evening. Jake Spavadol and uh, maybe Arizona. I, I decides think the Walker Robertson kids are really year. good. Uh, I I don't know. I don't think that like I just don't think they have any money. I don't think Arizona no, has. Right. That's why they had to go hire broke. the yeah. guy from San Jose State. Yeah, exactly. And Which they coach Ken's done a pretty good job out at San Jose State. They were competitive with Boise. By the way, did you see uh, the latest? Uh, Gaff from your boy Jojo. I love Jojo. Joey Galloway with a just a the biggest brain take of all time, <laughs> saying that Curtis O'Rourke should just sit out this week in a Columbus. I mean, it's it's so ignorant that I kind of like it. He said, on, "What is his? I, I missed this. What is this about?" He said that on, on, that on Tuesday night's show that Indiana should bench Curtis Rourke against Ohio State to prevent him from getting injured injured just like what happened uh, with what's-his-name at Florida State last year. Jordan Travis. Uh, Jordan Travis, yeah. Oh, my God. And I think that way if they get beat, which, I, you know, they're two touchdown underdogs. The Indiana talk has just been off the rails this week. (laughs) But And then if they were to get beat by Ohio State, you could just say, yeah, he's he's hurt. He he didn't play in the game. You can't judge us. They'd still have zero quality wins. It's a. I think both can be true, and nobody likes to hear that on Twitter, obviously. Nobody likes to hear that just on any type of discussion program. I think both are probably true. It's a soft schedule, but they continually win, continue to win, so you got to give them some type of credit. There's 12 teams in the playoffs. I mean... I think they're going to get their ass kicked this week. There's room for a team that just... There's room for several teams that don't deserve to be... Even when there were four teams, we all knew there were either two or three that had a chance to win it. The Texas talk is a little the, over the top, too. Like I think Texas is really good. I don't care what their key wins are. They shouldn't be punished because of the schedule. It was funny, though, that ESPN had a graphic that one of their key wins was against Arkansas and one of Tennessee's worst losses was Arkansas. against Arkansas. Against Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, what, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? I mean, I, I, I think people are starting to come around to the idea that Tuesday nights and having to hear from the uh, committee chief or whatever you want to call him, Ward Manuel, like, you shouldn't care about anything they have to say, but people go week to week like it is the gospel. Which, it's not the gospel that I picked up because I went and saw my mom the other day out of school and they have new books. Oh, God. All right. Um, um, just off the rails. Guys, I, I, I guess I'm alone. I just, I think Texas is just okay. Like, I, I mean, like, they're good. Don't get, uh, okay, it's strong. I think they're good. I think the thing that everybody is struggling to deal with there's not a great team out there this there's year. There's not a Georgia. There's, like, there's not an Alabama. And it's no. kind of awesome there, because nothing. of that, right? It's, it's yeah, awesome. no, like, I love it. Like, you, I, the playoff's going to be great. If it's, you make the dance, I could make an argument for probably 11 teams to win the national championship. It's awesome as a general college football fan. Sure. If you're an Oklahoma fan, you're like, what the bleep? Because yeah, it, be, why, why do you say that? Just because it's like every, every it seems like, Anytime OU got in the playoff, they had no chance. Oh, yeah, you put, you put yeah. Kyler on it on on yeah. You put Kyler's offense on yeah out on the field. OU might be head and shoulders above everybody. If OU had, had a pretty, I mean, yeah, they'd be pretty like, good. They'd exactly. be pretty good. That's why I think like well, old, I think we said it on the podcast a couple weeks ago. Like coming out of the uh, Georgia game, if I'm in Vegas right now, like Old Miss, I can, I'd I like a, them. Yeah, I put a bet on Old Miss to win three games in December. I think they could do it, yeah. I we'll see. But I, I think, think Texas well, a, could do it, too. I mean, I just don't think that there's... Yeah. I, 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 you can, I don't think that Texas is a complete team, but they're good enough to win it all. Just like Alabama's good enough to win it all. Just like Ole Miss is good is enough it, to win it all. Is it too knee-jerk reaction to say, like, the Dan Lanning decision to fake the field goal on Saturday night? Like, that's an example that I, I guess, easily point to to say, he's going to cost him a game. Gonna cost him a game in a big moment, and I like Dan Lanning. I think he's awesome. Like the uh, speech that he gave in front of the team, talking about embracing the jump around thing at the beginning of the fourth quarter in Madison, it fired me up. It was awesome, but I don't know. Like I'm, I'm just not sold on Oregon, and maybe it's because I'm a little jaded in the idea. Like, could Dylan Gabriel go win a national championship? I would love to. I don't think I'm cheering against him by any means. I just don't know if I could envision. Or picture the idea of 
him holding a Heisman Trophy and winning a national championship this year. But how many quarterbacks I in mean, the playoff right now would you take over Dylan Gabriel? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, <laughs> exactly there's, my there's question. very few. Yep. There's very few. Yeah. And it, and it almost has to be like with a qualifier, like, well, Jalen Milrow, if he's playing really well, like, you know, it's Jackson like, Dart, same thing. Yeah, Jackson yeah. Dart, if he's playing really well. The team that's kind of skating under the radar right now is Notre Dame. And I still don't know. I guess we'll find out a little bit more about them this weekend uh, when they go play Army at uh, Yankee Stadium, which should be pretty cool. But I don't know. It's The whole thing is wide open, though, to your point. It would be unbelievable if Notre Dame had two losses. There's, there's a small, teams. like very, 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 very small part of me that just goes, just go full heel and cheer for Colorado to win the national championship. No. I don't know if I'm ready for that. No. But it kind of sounds fun when I say it. They also could. I don't, I don't think they could. I don't I, think I they can either. I, I think the Big 12 is just, it's a, it's a good league. It's not, they don't have a national title contender in their conference right now. That's I think fair. Colorado is a, I mentioned the Kyler team. And by the team. way, I think Colorado gets beat this weekend. I mentioned the uh, Kyler team. Colorado to me is kind of like a poor man's version of that team. Great quarterback. They probably have Big higher in guys, yeah. right? But because there are, you know, obviously two of them. I mean, them. Rambo was the best. It was either no, no, CD, CD was Lamb CD and was Hollywood Brown. Okay. OU, t- 2018 yeah. OU would beat this Colorado. But Hollywood was hurt. I think that's fair. Yeah. Oh, Lord, uh, 2018 know. OU would murder this Colorado team. I mean, would bad. it be like 75 to 62 though? It'd, it'd be, be it'd be fair. The like, over Colorado under never be. got the ball like with a chance to win the game, it, but absolutely, Vegas could not. I think it'd be over high enough. I think it game. would be like like be in the legitimately like fifty nine to like forty two or something or forty five. Yeah, 50, yeah. Not 45, I can see like that. that. I can see that. It's crazy. So, um, I mean, oh, uh, okay. Here's one thing, Josh, because we probably get back to OU. Yeah, we. <laughs> I'm not picking them to win the national championship. I think they have uh, disqualified themselves. <laughs> just to be clear. Well, this year. I think George and I have kind of felt the same way about... I don't know the same way. That's, that might not be accurate. But Josh, you clearly were bothered by Brent coming out yesterday and, and reaffirming his stance on commitment and, and visiting. Uh, and you feel like... And I said... it. I, this is what I said in the war room. I, I was like... You know, that only works when you have the advantage, which Oklahoma doesn't have right now. But I also understand, I still understand why they do it. Because you have to know who is in your class because you're essentially giving up. And Josh, I know you know this. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Oh, sure, sure. You give up on recruiting guys that you would want on your roster to take a commitment from someone. And maybe the fallacy isn't, that you 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 have that stance, but that you stop recruiting people. And to me, in this day and age, can't do that. Like, I know you want to do that. I know it'd be easier if you could just focus on your four or five guys. You've got to have plan B, guys. Like, I don't care how solid a guy sounds. These coaches know they've done. I mean, this isn't a young, I mean, like, it's a young staff, but they're not inexperienced. They know how recruiting goes. You're going to lose some guys, no matter how, solid they seem and how involved their parents are and how much you feel like you've checked every box you're gonna have to keep recruiting other guys because you're gonna have to pivot sometimes that's just the way it goes um well and let me throw this out too josh like yeah it it, it also pays off doubly if you ever have to go back into the portal for a kid that you just stopped recruiting uh you know Mm -hmm. in going into his senior year if you still have had that relationship that might help you down the line in the portal. Absolutely. And, and again, and to their credit, I don't think that's what OU coaches do. And I understand, like, once you've got a commitment and you don't have a scholarship spot, you are going to step back a little bit. You're not going to have the same, you know, amount of energy toward recruiting a guy that you know you can't take right now. Like, I understand that. I really do. But at the same time, I just I, – every school has this pol- – not every school – a lot of schools have this policy. I don't understand why OU feels the need to say it with their chest. Stop saying it. Just stop making a thing of it. And I know at this point, it's out there. Like, you can't bring it back. I said it from the start. You never should have said it. Because what happens is Michael Vazuzzi goes to Texas, and they're like, Mike, they don't even consider you committed. You're not flipping. You're not doing anything wrong. They don't consider you a commitment right now. You're on our campus. Even though Texas knows if the roles were reversed, they'd feel the same way. 
but they don't have a quote or Oklahoma wouldn't have a quote that th- from the daily Oklahoman or from wherever else they want to go get a newspaper and they can say, Hey Mike, look right here. It's in bold print. Like just don't say it. There's no reason to they give. I don't know what it gains you by advertising. Now in a private meeting with Michael Fasusi, Yeah, sure. You can lay that out. No problem. But to put a big bullseye on it, I, I I don't think it, it, it uh, the perfect analogy. I just don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. I don't think you're getting out of it what you're hoping to because we've watched guys every single class since Brent's been here have taken other visits, have flipped, have decommitted. What are you accomplishing? To to be fair to Brent, I'll push back a little bit, Josh. He hasn't said it until he got directly asked about it fair. Yes, yesterday. That's fair. Like it was, and even then, like I think the question was phrased like, "Isn't this your policy?" And Brent basically is like, "Yeah, that's still our policy." And then like, like was asked to basically clarify what it was, and then he said it because I think he was getting irritated by the interaction. But like, I don't think it's like I, you know, I don't know. Maybe he has said it more often. I haven't heard it though. But like, he was yeah. directly at. I get what you're saying, but he was directly yeah, asked right. about you're it right. yesterday. Well, because of what's and to going be on. fair to Brent and his annoyance, it came up again, uh, something about dropping players. Yeah. That's never been the policy. That's not what it is. Like, and I'm, and I, I get lumped in with people like, you don't get it. You don't, I know what it is. Like I, I've, I've talked to people about it. Like, it's not that I don't understand. I just disagree with the reasoning for it. I just yeah. don't think it accomplishes what you want it to accomplish, but OU's not dropping people. That's not. I think the one guy they probably did that with was Ashton Cozart two years ago. And Ashton Cozart ended up going to Oregon. He's already left Oregon. He's now back at SMU. Like, fine. Like, I, I think they made, I think they were trying to make an example with a player they knew they could replace pretty easily. So, whatever. But, like, I, I, but, again, and I think when in this situation, and I, guys, that's the interesting question to me. So obviously, we know that conversation's coming up yesterday because of Michael Fasusi. Obviously, they're, they're, you know I, I get it. At the same time, if you're Brent, I I sit here and I'm like, well, how would I answer that? Because if I say, you know, we get it, you know, in this situation, obviously there's answers that we don't have for these guys yet, and we understand that, and we know that makes it difficult for them and their families to prepare you're kind of opening the door for every offensive commitment on the roster in the class to be like, well, I want to look around too. Yeah. You know, like I've got the same, same issues. So like, I, I am empathetic to not, you know, saying, okay, like, and just being like, look, we get it. You know, we don't want to put a, a target on anybody's back. Like we understand that there, there's questions that need to be asked right now. But at the same time, if you go down that road, you are really shooting yourself in the foot. But again, that's what this whole thing creates. Like you said it out loud forever ago and it's nobody's forgetting it because like I said, lots of schools have this policy. There's a reason none of them say it like this. None of them put it out there for everybody. They just gloss over it because there's no reason to make it a talking point over and over and over again and kind of get hung up on it. And I think it's it's important to clarify because I saw a lot of people and, and I think most OU fans know this, but a lot of people in my mentions because on three picked up the quote from from Brent and I was tagged in it and a lot of people I think just assume that that means oh Michael Fasusi is going to Texas this weekend oh you's not going to take him anymore that is not the case trust me if if no. Michael Fasusi goes on these two trips and still wants to go to Oklahoma Oklahoma's taking his ass like that's I think that needs to be clarified I think a lot of people just jump to the conclusion. And Brent even clarified yesterday about his policy. He's like, the offer's not taken away. They're not taking away the offer. They just don't view you as as committed. I but, would like to propose a change to uh, OU's uh, commitment um, procedures. What if they made people, when you said you were committed, they make you go get baptized in the reflecting pond, like right there in front of the stadium? That'd be so sick. And then if you, and then if you. Well, I don't know the, how the Catholics it'd be would part do it. of the soul mission. Yeah, I'll do them. I'll do the baptisms. I'll and get in then the water, if you people. went on another trip, you had to get rebaptized in the reflecting pond because you were no longer saved or whatever you wanted to call it. You, you've become a sinner again. 
Yes. I mean, the Catholics and the Baptists do it so different. So, I don't know. Should there be a confessional if you're... You get, I, what would be the... I mean, you get christened when you're a baby, right? I'm sorry, Father. I had baptized. thoughts of Texas. I think you just get, get baptized. Get, yeah, okay. You get baptized when you're a baby in the Catholic yeah. Church. Yeah. But you never have to get baptized again. No. You get confirmed. That's correct. Can you be unconfirmed? I mean... Technic, I mean, yeah, you could just. Is that there's not like a per, there's not a procedure for that. Yeah, they, they don't is have like, like a, a lapsed Catholic. Yeah, if you just don't go to church anymore. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's keep it Southwest Oklahoma and just go with baptisms. Put on the white robes and dunk them. And he'd be good at that. I'm I mean, just, but if we're gonna do that, wouldn't it be like best at Lake Thunderbird to really make it significant if it's gonna be? A well, you Southwest can't do Oklahoma it at the style? Duck Pond because that thing is disgusting. <laughs> just take everybody to Falls <laughs> Creek; they get a lifetime of experiences. It sounds like. There's really. I good learned story. a lot at Falls Creek. Through There's the years. a really good story about a guy getting high at at uh, Falls Creek and ending up in the Arbuckle Wilderness. That sounds terrifying, but I can see how it happens. I think he didn't realize where he was until he saw giraffes. No. But if you're high and you see a giraffe in Oklahoma, my God. You've never been miserable until you sat in that tabernacle in July for like two hours. That sounds awful. That was 175 degrees. In that Thank giant. God. I First Baptist easily. Duncan was only there to win the softball championship. <laughs> then you guys got out. <laughs> then we checked Get in, out. get yeah. out. Any, I don't want to go any further. Sounds like some of what the youth pastors are doing down there. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so today's tangents have been so hard to get us back on track. I don't know why, but they just have. Um, okay, let's let's you guys. As I said, you did the practice report. You're going to have uh, the game day preview coming up. Yeah, uh, you'll have. Um, uh, we'll have uh, Trevor Knight on the family business Ooh, this week. TK nine. Good good week to have TK nine on with Alabama coming to town. Love Trevor Knight. Maybe he can sprinkle Still some Still probably magic. one of the more, I'm just trying to think, like, from an area of surprise, uh, that game in the 11 years that I've been covering OU, probably one of the most surprising performances. Absolutely. Sugar Bowl, I think well, everything. Well, you remember, like, it was such a patchwork offensive line. Yeah, um, it was crazy. Like, I remember seeing Derrick Henry in the... Uh, bottom of the hotel there in new orleans and was like oh that guy must be a defensive tackle and then he went and sat down at the running back or at the derrick henry podium i was like oh f- <laughs> all right well it was awesome but it was I think that was like my first nick saban experience too who was their big linebacker then um uh god i i, I can see him wasn't he number nine maybe he's still been playing in the nfl uh god yeah number nine i think he was uh look it up Say like Cosby or something like around uh, that name. It's gonna be an all like twelve time all pro. We're idiots. What would that have been? 2015, 2016, probably. What's the question? Twenty thirteen linebacker would have been the linebacker for uh, Alabama on that twenty fourteen. Yeah, the All American C J Mosley. C J Mosley. Yeah. I just remember going up to him at media pick. day and thinking, "Wow, that's." That's C.J. Mosley. Like, he was a smallish type guy, just in person. I don't remember. I, I just remember, what's his name? Derrick Henry just being a monster of a person. It was like, holy <laughs> crap. But the reason C.J. Mosley surprised me is because of uh, who was the one dude at the first five-star, Josh, that was just... O.J. Howard. No, 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 not the tight The linebacker that went to Alabama that was just oh. a massive human being. Yes, uh... Oh damn it! Who was that? I know because the two that one. The only things I ever remember were um, Donta Hightower, OJ. Yeah, no. that would have been. I'd been after him, um, like Ruben something. Foster, Ruben, Ruben Foster. Foster. That's exactly yeah. who it was. Yeah, mm-hmm. like I was like, okay, that's what an Alabama linebacker looks like, even in high school, like. But C.J. Mosley wasn't built like Ruben that was Foster. still on like the verge of Alabama turning into the monster that they became. Like that was at yeah. the onset, yeah. like the beginning stages of that thing. Yeah, they weren't truly terrifying yet. And Reuben Foster, I think he played for the Raiders and then like quit after a couple of years. 
I really don't remember. Alaba- <laughs> the first four guys in Alabama's class, that 2013 class, Reuben Foster, Jonathan Allen, who was a first-round pick, Derrick Henry, and O.J. Howard. God. That's – oh, another guy in that class, Alvin Kamara. That turned out I right. mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, that's just wild. And they literally Eddie Jackson. Did not, they did not use O.J. Howard to his potential until, like, the national championship game. And then they threw him, like, nine yeah. targets or something. Ruben uh, Foster, the last team that he played for, inside linebacker for the Arlington Renegades. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Okay. Played for Bob. It is crazy, too, that uh, OU and Alabama, they've only played seven times previous to this. And uh, I think I want to, was it? No, this will be six. This will be the seventh time. They played six times. This is only the third time that it's going to be an on-campus game, which is, I guess, self-explanatory. You just would have thought in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, OU and Alabama would have been playing all the time. So all the games I've covered... OU is three and one against Alabama. Yeah. Orange Bowl, Sugar Bowl, and then the two um, home games. Yeah. No, no, no. Or, well, one the home in Alabama. Alabama the, home, one, yeah. the home games in Tuscaloosa and Norman. So this will be the fifth time I've seen him play Alabama. Yes. Same. It's crazy. I had forgotten until that the thing OU football put out. I had forgotten that OU had jumped out to such a huge lead in that first game in Norman, you know, the Ronald, Ronaldo Works games. Like, yeah. I remember that Alabama took that late lead, but I didn't remember OU being out that big in the first half. Ronaldo Works, little brother. Uh, I played AAU basketball and football with him. Really? Roderick, big rod. Hmm. Yeah, 23-3, to three, and then the comeback was on. Ended up winning the game by 10, 37-27. So Brody Croyle was Guys. the first quarterback they played. Who was Alabama's yep. quarterback when they played in Norman? Uh, well, it was would that, have been 2002, 2003. Someone's yelling at the podcast right now. Uh huh. It's probably my dad. He knows. <laughs> okay, we we got to stop this because uh, we're just we're just googling throughout the, when we're talking about Alabama. Yeah, no, I, I did want to say as a funny note to buy somebody a second while we, uh, Tyler Watts was their quarterback that year. Oh yeah, um, the the fun was Ruben Foster Hoover? is from Auburn, Alabama. Wasn't he the guy that was on that Hoover High School MTV show? No, because that Tyler Watts ooh, that would have came out that was, in two thousand four, two thousand. Maybe it was his I little was brother high, that was the quarterback. I was still that in was high the, school when I, that came was out. Was that the John Parker Wilson? Kid? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, John Hoover? Parker yes. Wilson was the yeah. kid. Yeah. yeah. It's a great show. That what a, a great, great show, show that was. Show. And what's oh his name? God, just running so around being crazy. Rush probes. Rush probes. All that was time before dude. everyone knew what a scumbag he was. Yeah, but he accepts it, and we like that. <laughs> he accepts that he's a scumbag. <laughs> he's in, he's in the Bruce Pearl clan of yeah. I'm a scumbag. What's what's it to you? I love Bruce Pearl. Ever since he was coaching, uh, who was he coaching in that tournament? Uh, when OU played in Birmingham. See, we can't keep doing this. this is like well, it's one person that keeps doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> that's fact. That's that's my fault. Um, anyway, so outside of everything else that's been talked about, uh, it's senior day. Danny Stutzman, Billy Bowman, uh, you know, came back for this year. Just terrible for how it's worked out for them. You feel bad. Yeah. I mean, they're part of that fivesome. You know, Ethan, Downs, Woody Washington, Jalil Farouk. We'll see what ends up happening with his situation. He can come back. But, yeah, it, it's been a shitty year. It sucks. I, we've talked to Danny about that a couple times. Just like, I think, was it after the South Carolina game that I asked him, like, the shit sucks. I'm sure you didn't sign up to come back for this. But he's been the adamant, you know, kind of the leader for this team, obviously, the last two years. And, I don't think I've ever seen a guy grow up as much as yeah. Danny has. I remember as a we had that conversation here. after the uh, Russell Athletic Bowl. Is like, is this guy going to ever wake up? Is he going to be, he's obviously a really good football player. He's taken steps in his first two couple seasons in Norman, but is he going to be that leader? And, you know, Teddy gave him a hard time, kind of leaned on him. I know they have a really good relationship. And hopefully, even despite the record, Danny's going to go down as one of the uh, all time linebackers in Oklahoma history. Broke into the top 10 in career tackles. He's had an excellent season. Yeah, I mean, it's been incredible to watch just how much he's grown. And just when we talk to him, just 
how much he takes on himself. I mean, he's become a coach on the staff. And, yeah. And I, obviously, you know, a big part of why they're so good. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see this defense without him if everybody sticks around. Sure. And, Where do you guys think he'll get drafted? That, we were talking about that on the way home from practice the other night. Obviously, uh, Billy and Danny have both uh, been invited, accepted senior bowl invites. Me and George also think that Ethan Downs probably should get a senior bowl invite when it's all said and done. I know they kind of do those in phases. Uh, where do you see those guys? Uh, it's a great question, though, George. Like, where does Danny and where do Billy get drafted? I think Danny will get drafted before Billy. I, I think too. that's fair. Uh, I think Danny could His go. His physical like, measurables. Yeah. You, you said day two, maybe, for Danny. Da- like I think for sure three. day two. It's second just a question round. of second or third. Yeah. yeah. What's Danny going to run in the 40? That's, That's my exactly That's the question. conversation that we had. I, I really don't know. I mean, I think he's probably a little bit more. I, I, he's I probably he's faster be, than I think he I yes. bet he's yeah. four, five, four, six. Probably four, six. Yeah, I, I would guess like low four, like four six three, four six four, something like that. Like, and that at his size, that's plenty good. Like, yeah, he'll, he'll have plenty of he can people move, happy. He with can that. move better than Kenneth, can he? Kenneth Murray, St- Danny, no, no, not like no. I mean, Kenneth was like trying freak. to think. Ken- yeah. Kenneth was a safety. Kenneth's a I mean, freak. Yeah. Kenneth yeah. ran like a four four. Ken- Kenneth runs like just few guys I've seen it on you. Okay, I'm just trying to gauge like where I where yeah. I think he would end up. <laughs> You know, you know, a comparable athlete to me to him would be Ronell. Like, I wonder what Ronell run. I like, I, I could see them being of similar, you know, like just similar overall like speed. Like, I could, I could see them running in a. Uh, I guess I keep saying similar, but in a a comparable way. Ronell ran a four seven two at the combine. Mm-hmm. I, if, if you told me that, I would. I, I could buy that. I think Danny's faster than that. Kenneth Murray ran but, a four four five two. Jeez, yeah, he's a mutant. I've got Ronell at four four six eight. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Googling once again. We're now we're Google battling. <laughs> I mean, this hey, is but a at least we're this Googling NFL Oklahoma com. football players. Like, yeah, yeah. Now, now we're. We're working towards something. Billy is the interesting one to me. I I think Danny's probably mid to late second, early third. Billy, I don't think Billy could do second just because of his size. He hasn't had the great senior year. I mean, it hasn't hasn't been as bad as some people have tried to make it out to be, but it hasn't been the, the big play after big play like it was in 23. And I wonder, too, Josh, with Billy, if he tries to either at the senior bowl or the combine pro day whatever show that he can return kicks because i do think that teams might be interested in him as a special teams guy if he can show that ability i don't know for sure but i it probably wouldn't hurt him to sh- at least show hey i can catch kickoffs and punts and stuff like that but and i think i think he can oh he definitely can but i'm saying that like to show them yeah sure i, I see what you're saying like i i don't know that could be something too i think he's a third or fourth round guy it depends on yeah. I think he'll test well, but his size is something that I think a lot of scouts are going to have a tough time getting over. Cuz he's not like at his size to test, you know, like you know, if you're if you're doing a sliding scale of here's your measurables, here's what you run. At his size, he needs to be run like 4 threes. He's not going to run 4 threes. Like he runs well, but he's not like that. Um so I I think there's going to be a really interesting conversation for people to have. What I think is kind of interesting, would he get a look as like a nickel corner maybe type of guy? Yeah. Like, could he play that? Definitely. Like, I think that would be a really interesting fit for him for in certain defenses. I don't think he'd work every everywhere. Definitely. I think that that is certainly a position that, I again, wouldn't be shocked if he at uh, the senior bowl or combine tries and do, like does a little bit of, you know, slot mm-hmm. corner. Billy Bowman is going to get picked up by like the Ravens in the fifth round and win three Super Bowls or something. It'd be awesome. We're like uh, five hours away from the first injury report this week. Yeah, that's kind of gone under the radar this weekend. George, I don't know. We really haven't talked about it a whole lot. Like Michael Tarquin, possibly, maybe back in action this week. He was just so limited up in Columbia, even during uh, pregame stuff. It was hard to imagine that. 
I, I was surprised they guy. even brought him. I yeah, mean, I mean, well, I, they, they had they to. had to though. They had nobody else. That um, was part of the dark conversation that George and I had. It's like <laughs> they literally don't have another breathing human that can play tackle right now. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, um, I think Farouk will play. Um, I know that he was limited in the Missouri game. I do think he'll play. I don't think they're going to shut him down. No, I it's been two weeks. I don't know that for sure, but I think he'll want to play. Uh, Burks, concussions are always kind of tricky, and that was a really tough concussion. So I don't I don't know. Javante Barnes, I think he's going to be questionable. Uh, Brent did say on his teleconference today that uh, they expect to have Gavin Sawchuk back. I don't know if that helps you at all, considering Gavin hasn't really played all season. Um, but other than that, that's that's kind of it. I think Javante is still dealing with the ankle. I think the ankle injury was worse than... I mean, was that the most heroic performance in I, OU football history that he was able to rush for 203 on a bum ankle? I, I know it was so. against Maine, but Jesus. I guess so. I don't, I don't know what exactly is going on there, but it's definitely worse than just a, it might have been like a high ankle sprain yeah. when it when it comes to those guys i know you've talked a lot about guys coming back and here's something we haven't mentioned at all but it could be out of all the things that have happened in college football over the last few years whether it was the covid extensions nil uh you know multiple transfers like this could be the thing that changes college football even more than than anything else, what if Diego Pavia wins his court case for unlimited eligibility? Like, even I mean, if it goes already, to appeals and gets overturned, there could be it, a period where... did they already where, come out and be like, yeah, no thank you? No, they, 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 they denied him an instant injunction. Oh, okay. But he's still the, going to court. I thought the lawsuit wasn't for... Uh, I thought it was for uh, not taking away JUCO years. Well, yeah, for, but it's going to... It would allow everyone to basically keep coming back that prevent the NCAA from saying you, you your eligibility is limited. Well, that would be crazy. I don't want to see it. I mean, I think it's, I don't it like would anybody be does. You're going to have guys playing forever. Yeah. Although, how many they're going to have doctors? Like this team has this many doctors because they've had to go to school for so. Long. Myron Rolls finally got to come back as a doctor to college football. <laughs> Well, Eddie, I was just thinking, OU's got a quarterback problem. We know a guy just sitting out there, hanging out, playing a lot of golf. Sam B, you want to come back and save the program? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think he likes playing golf every day <laughs> and running around and chasing Bowden. Oh. That'd be awesome, though. I would have a hard time picking against Oklahoma every game. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it could make, you know whether you have to appeal for a hardship or whatever, just irrelevant. Yeah, I, I honestly, I saw the story, never read it, and to be completely frank, I don't care if Diego Pavia is playing again. I don't think That's anybody a good story. does. With Diego Pavia, yeah, and Vanderbilt. Unless they come up with a rule that says like you, you can keep coming back, you just have to go to a new school every year. <laughs> so like, you know, thirty three year old on his twelfth school. He's played on 14 of the 16 SEC t programs. You really, truly would just be coming pro, I guess, in college. NCAA would love those commercials. At one point, though, you think the collectives would just be like, nah, we're good. We're not going to pay Yeah, anything. I mean, I, I would hope so at some point. You've got to have somebody better than a 28-year-old. Yeah, if you're good enough to stay in college but not good enough to go to pro, I don't want to pay for you. Yeah, I just I don't think that's a um, I don't know reality. No. Um, one other thing I wanted to hit on before we get out of here is, is another thing I know Josh you were kind of back and forth on is the hundred and five scholarship limit rule. I don't know how, where you stand on that. Do you think that that's too many? Not enough? Oh, I mean. As far as scholarships, like I, th I think it's absolutely enough. Um, I and I get, I, I get why coaches are like, oh, if we hate this, but it's really tough for me to hear like people. You know, I, I know Dabo complained about it. I know Brent was kind of looped in on a story about it. It's tough for me to hear those guys be like, oh, you don't even know. Like this is going to be so tough when NFL teams are running practice with fifty-three guys or running a longer season. It can be done. 
secondarily, you've got all these G fives that like all the guys that are filling out the back end of your roster would be starters for these G fives. And they're just guys that are practice filler for you. And you're talking about how tough it is to run a practice and get a good, you know, look and that kind of stuff. Like, man, okay. Like I, I I'm not saying that your numbers aren't cut down because we know, I mean, and that's something I, I really do commend Brent Venables for. They've done such a good job with the walk-on program. Their walk-ons are legitimately good football players these days. They, they've really done a lot in that direction. Um, guys, I, it, it to me it begs the question, I'm not seeing Oklahoma running out and putting out a whole lot of new offers for a, a rule that's going to be in place to, tw- to add 20 new scholarships next year. Do you think they're just going to give a lot of scholarships to a lot of these walk-on guys? Do you think that's kind of the plan? If they want to keep them, they kind of have. Well, I, and I don't know if it's scholarships as much as it is just NIL deals. And that's kind of yeah. what they've been doing. But, mm-hmm. I mean, look, NFL teams have 53-man rosters in, what, 16 practice squad roster spots? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, they get by in a much more physical league with grown men on much smaller rosters. So... You're going to tell me that 105 can, isn't enough? But there's a lot, there's a lot. You can pick and choose your guys. You can go pick sign and choose. a guy. You can go trade for someone. You can go sign for someone. Like there's, It's a hell of a lot easier than if you fo- have college your football. top five receivers injured. And, you can go trade for yeah. whoever. You know, like that. It's, sure. It's not, it's not exactly comparable. It, it's not, but like, like the example Kerry brings. Okay, five wide receivers. Yeah, that's brutal. That's also such a wild ass outlier like that's not normal like that there's a reason we've talked about it over and over again because it is so unusual it's so unlikely and you're taught guys even with if you include the practice squad guys you're still talking about a difference of almost 40 bodies like that's you can manage that like you can like i understand like i think coaches just hate change like all change like i've never seen a change where the coach was like yeah that's good like that, that that'll work better for us. Like, there's always like, well, now that sucks. That sucks, and then everybody just adapts and they move on, and like, it, and it's fine. But the stuff that coaches like, the stuff that coaches now think is a problem, forty years ago, or that they think, I'm sorry, that the coaches now think is normal. The coaches thirty years ago, like, this is going to be the end of the sport. Like, this is insane, and then everybody just adapts to it. Like, I, again, I. I do understand the frustration at the same time. I don't think it's worth the teeth gnashing that everybody creates over it. Yeah, I think you're right. Just the change is something that a lot of coaches do not handle well. A lot of people don't handle change. So Yeah, I fix that. Coaches are unfair. People in general suck with change. Eddie can't imagine that. I people can't hate imagine change. that. Sad. <laughs> people just got to adapt. If you don't know, Eddie hates change. Um, Jim McAway. Accepted the White House. What? <laughs> Jim McElwain is retiring from Central Michigan. Oh, going out with a win last night, too. I guess they have one more game left. A little action last night. Central Michigan sharks. upset Western Michigan. Big party in Kalamazoo. Or, no, Mount Pleasant. My apologies to the people of Michigan. All right. Um, Josh, anything else recruiting-wise we needed to hit on? Um, No, you know, like I kind of touched on you know, the possibility of Michael Fasusi and, you know, maybe some other guys you got to keep an eye on talking to some people. Um, a Marion Robinson, I mentioned the recruiting report that I've got some concerns there. You talk to people around Norman and they act pretty confident about that situation. They seem to feel pretty good. He, he visited Arkansas last weekend. Uh, now he's got several teammates there at part view that are Arkansas commitments. His buddy, Ja'Cory Smith is looking at OU and Arkansas and a whole bunch of others. Um, so uh, there's a few things in play there. Uh, but when you talk to Oklahoma folks, there, there seems to be confidence that it's all going to be good and it's going to be fine. Um, Emmanuel Choice, I think that's more about like surely someone's going to get crazy here and get serious about this guy who, you know, for those that missed it, jumped into the on three top 100 uh, this week in our updated new rankings. And guys, I mean, he's 6'4, 210 and can do some stuff that's just not normal. So he's. He's well worth that ranking, and I, I, I think that's kind of the deal. A lot of people like myself are like, someone's going to get serious and try to try to flip this kid, right? And so far, I haven't heard anything that I think is that substantial, but it wouldn't shock me if, say, like an A&M kind of came in and really, really tried to make a run at Manny Choice. All right. Um, lots of stuff to come. Anybody, uh, let's... 
Anybody got a prediction? Let's just say who we think will end up the offensive coordinator at this point. Ben Arbuckle. Ditto. I agree. That's kind of where I'm at. And I don't I, look. That's that's. I want to be clear because there's going to be a lot of people that run with that and be like, "You guys said that's who it's going to be." That's a guess on a large. Like I, I think that there's a yeah, there's I mean, definitely Bryles. Bryles, yeah. or Bryles. That's out there. Yeah. I'm just kidding. That's not but out there. I think that's just us looking at the situation, connecting dots. He's certainly in the running. He's a very strong candidate. I would say the same thing about Joe Craddock. I think that he is also a very strong candidate that's in the running. It just comes down to what Brent prefers, and I do think that How about this, this time next week we'll have a way better idea. How about this too, George? So Joe Craddock could possibly be in the playoff. Yeah. Ben Arbuckle will be f- they'll free be done, of those obligations. Yeah, they'll be done after November 30th outside of a bowl game. They're going to yeah. make a bowl game, but they got beat by New Mexico on Saturday. So, I mean, to me, availability sometimes, is, is always said, is the best availability. And I do think, I don't know, or you guys ability. tell me, I was thinking about this today, is this the best offensive coordinator job available right now in the country? Yes, because it's produced multiple head coaches. But I'm just saying of the other jobs, I'm not You'd saying have like, to remind me. I, Florida, Florida State, State, obviously. What else is Wisconsin, out there? Wisconsin. That's it right now. But okay. could, could uh, uh, you know, I don't know if there's other positions that could open somewhere else. Sure. But I mean, as of yeah, right now, of I right think now, it is the yeah, best job. Yeah, it is the best job. Because is. even Florida State. I, I think it is. If he, uh, sorry, was, George. Was Unless like Georgia opens up or something like that, because yeah, I think they're dissatisfied with the offense this year. But the Florida State, the Florida State job, Mike Norvell calls the plays. Sure, and yeah. you know I would assume most offense coordinators want to call their own plays. So do you? Do we think? And I guess this is another question for another day. But like, is it just? And because I think the outside right now, like on online or on the message boards or wherever. Is it just assumed, say it's Ben Arbuckle, is it just assumed, no questions asked, like, John Mateer's coming? Or if it's Craddock, Darian, Mitt, like, is it a package deal for these guys? I think that it is for Mateer and Arbuckle. I don't know about the others. And I would also say with Mateer, while I think right now it is presumed that is what is what is going on, once he gets in the portal, all hell's going to break loose. Oh, sure. You know, uh, Oklahoma might come to him and be like, hey, you're going to come follow Ben Arbuckle, right? Well, if, you know, Ohio State, for example, or somebody else comes along and says, hey, we've got a pretty good deal going on over here, too. Yeah. We'll, give you, we'll give you more money. And there whatever. are going to be schools like an Ohio State or like a uh, Colorado or whoever yeah. that they are going to be looking for a quarterback, just like everybody Florida else State, across the country. Florida State's yeah. going to be looking for I mean, sure. A ton of places. So while it, it feels like that is a safe bet, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't just assume that those guys are coming no matter what because you just never know what's going to happen in the transfer portal. I, I mean, would hell, also. Dylan Gabriel was at UCLA, yeah. and then the next day is at Oklahoma. Yeah, it's crazy. I would also say because um, Jackson Arnold has professional representation, they're probably trying to open up negotiations with OU's NIL collective to find out if they're interested in having him back. And they're probably saying, well, we can't, we don't you know. Until Jackson we Jackson Arnold. What did I say? Actually, Dylan Gabriel. Jackson Arnold, yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys just mentioned Dylan Gabriel, sorry. Um, That's your brain. No, it's okay. You've been doing all the screwing up lately, so I just wanted to take it back from you. I have no screw-ups. Zero screw-ups. What screw did we have the other day? He called... Uh, I can't remember, but he he also keeps calling the recruiting report the recruiting rewind. Yeah. Well, that's not my problem. It's hundred percent your problem. Not my mouth. It's hundred percent coming problem. from your brain and your mouth. I never well, screw anything up. My brain's already screwed up. I've been on record as that. <laughs> so Jackson Arnold, I, I would imagine there's Yes, you're right though. That you know, they're probably delaying saying, Well, we gotta wait till the offensive coordinator's named. Yeah, and I think that that's OU has to do what's best for them. Sure. And what's best for them is focusing on the offensive coordinator hire and then going from there. And, and you know, I that sucks for a guy like Jackson Arnold, but Jackson Arnold's going to, if if he enters the portal, when he, you know, whenever that happens, if it does happen, is going to have a lot of suitors. Yeah. And someone's going to pay him a lot of money. And he might end up being a really good quarterback in college. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not out on the idea that either of those guys can still have very fruitful careers. And I'm not out on the idea that Michael Hawkins could come back. 
Yeah, I because if you get a guy, every like, options on the table. If you get a guy, let's say they get John Mateer, who has two years left, he's still in the same situation that he would have been if Jackson Arnold came back. Like he signed up for that originally. Sure. So I don't. I don't know. Maybe he would still look elsewhere. I don't know. But and that's why it's interesting, Josh, with the recruiting situation at quarterback, because I think that they're going to want to try and maybe take two quarterbacks in this freshman class because. And I don't know Brendan Zerbrug at all. I'm just assuming he's going to be the odd man left out. He's going to maybe enter the portal. Casey Thompson's gone. One of Jackson Arnold and Michael Hawkins is probably going to hop in the portal. That leaves you with one guy. Plus, you know, if you bring in Kevin Sperry, do you bring in a, a Ficklin from Muskogee, who we talked about on the recruiting report, like, and then a, a portal guy? Like, You're going to have to totally rehaul that room, most likely. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing because, like, you know, people are like, well, you go to the portal. Okay, Casey Thompson kind of fell in their lap. Like, to have a guy with that level of experience in that situation, you're not likely to find a guy that just wants to be a part of the OU program for his last year of college football. Like, that, that's unlikely. What you're most likely going to find is a Davis Bevel, which we all know how that went. So, like, expecting that the portal is going to produce something other than the guy you, you know, whether it's Matier or Mensa or somebody else that whoever the OC is really likes, it's unlikely. You're, you're going to need, you're going to have one guy and then you're going to have a guy that's taken up a chair in the quarterback room. Like, that, that's really what it's going to be. So, Oklahoma is going to have to figure that out. And I, again, I, I think the, the, the bit of good luck, you know, I, I say they don't have the luck of another Casey Thompson having an experienced guy. The good luck they do have is it's an insane year for quarterbacks in the state of Oklahoma, and any of McComb, Adamson, or Ficklin, you could sell me on an argument where those guys, it all comes together, and they end up as really good college players. I, I could believe believe it on any of those guys. So I, I wouldn't rule anything out. All right, uh, that's going to do it uh, for this edition of the uh, Unofficial 40. We will be, be back for the Eskridge Lexus post game show. After the Alabama game, 6.30 kick, so it's going to be another late one. Uh, but we'll be there for you um, either when you wake up on Sunday or if you're up late uh, on Saturday night or sun- early Sunday morning. So, uh, Also, don't forget the game day preview uh, coming up with uh, Alabama beat writer Nick, Nick Kelly. Kelly. Nick yep. Kelly. Good friend. Uh, and then uh, TK9, Trevor Knight, is going to be on the family business as well. So lots of great content still to come uh, on our YouTube channel uh, coming up later this week. But uh, thank you, thanks for listening. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the Unofficial 40 right here on Soonerscoop.com.